I always screw up my recording settings when I do a live stream and then come back to this. Why would you, the settings have to be different? Yeah, it's way too quiet when I do it on online or on live. I wonder why. I have no idea. Uh, something different with YouTube. Well, it's probably the program. It's actually the program input versus. Oh, okay. Because now I'm using Adobe Audition. So your new video came out. How long has it been since your uh, documentary? Since the documentary came out? I think it came out in August. And here's the thing. I was like, before all this, before this like phase of my development as a YouTuber, I could pump out a video in three weeks, no problem, especially if I'm on camera. The reason I put myself on camera in the first place was- to Cut down editing. Was, yeah, so that like there's something on screen that I don't have to just make out of graphics. But as you can see, this video was just end-to-end -end graphics. And I watched hours of CNN from the 90s, 90s CNN. Oof. So you don't want to so you don't want to be on camera anymore? Well, ideally I wouldn't be. One my favorite comment was I I love your content but I fucking hate your ugly millennial face. <laughs> <laughs> Very constructive criticism. I know, I I know. change a face, bro. One of your videos, I feel like your Zizek video, like you were wearing like some like low cut tank top or whatever that that I feel like true. I was wearing a V-neck. I dress like that all the time. Just oh, too, and then I no okay. And here's the thing handsome, about that video: all the incels. <laughs> so many comments for wearing that, and I'm I'm used to that shit though. I've been called a hipster fuck since I was 17, and that's when the only actual hipsters. We're still in Brooklyn, not even Portland yet. But there was no thought put into that outfit. It wasn't trying to make a statement. It was like I was wearing that shirt already. And then the mic was banging around because it was like a V-neck. And then the jacket was on the chair in the room. So I put it on and clipped the mic to it. And I wasn't trying to make a fashion statement at all. But I guess I triggered some people to whom that's important. Anyway, if I'm... In the video at all, it really is just to save time or because the content is too abstract to use footage. But that's a really big deal to some people who fucking knew. People right? probably think that you have like, so you're very like, very hyper conscious of like your, your wardrobe choices. Can you please just confirm for our patron audience that I just dress like that? <laughs> he does. It's more, it's more his frame. Yeah. It's just this frame. Wearing, wearing it's, like a, a funky, colorful like t-shirt right now, but that's just a crew neck. It's how it's how clothes hang on his body, right? He's got like the shorter legs and the larger like torso section, and then he's got like <laughs> this sort of structure that makes him look skinny, even if he's got a paunch. Whereas like when I'm feeling skinny and I stand in front of the mirror, there's still a big shadow underneath, like where my <laughs> belly meets my crotch, and I'm like, "Fuck! I thought I was doing all right. Like I just perpetually look fat, no matter what." <laughs> Even if I'm like dad, I'm down to 190. I'm I'm 190 is like a good low weight for me. I feel but. like you pay. I feel like you paid way more attention than I ever have. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is very educational. You don't know what I think about. <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> it's hard to dress when you have a weird body type, but you've got the good body type where clothes just hang nicely. Everything you wear looks like you bought it at like Hugo Boss or something like that with the long shirts. I have a problem with my like thigh, so I have to buy like athletic fit like pants because like my thighs are just like too tight in normal size pants. Oh, do you always <laughs> rip like the crotch of your pants? Yeah, always. If it, I rip the crotch of every single pant, like I until I discovered athletic fit, which they now sell at like most of like the Gap slash Old Navy stores. They have like athletic fit as one of their standard fits, and it was like life changing. Athletic fit with the flex. Oh my god, perfect. Now, now I'm living the life big time. Big thigh problems. Yeah, I got Big that too. Problems, yeah, yeah my, the first place to go is always the crotch area. And I, I don't buy as many clothes now because all you see is my upper body anyway. So <laughs> if I lean too far forward right now, I could see my balls. So I'm not going to tell you. No one listening has to that's, see uh, has to see any of our upper bodies right now. This is where the subscriptions get made. And then we continue into the subject matter. <laughs> exactly, but, exactly. Eventually, I'm, Eventually, we'll get there. Till somebody's talked about their balls, we're not ready to start. Did you guys watch Pills' new video? Uh, no, not yet. It's 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 on my queue. It's on my YouTube queue next to all my far right conspiracy videos. <laughs> anyway, Pills, 
your new video. So like, so it's, it's taking longer now because you don't want to be on camera as much anymore. It's not even, it's not even that I don't want to, I basically chose that topic so that I could use footage as the content instead of myself as the content. Cause I thought, so that would was, you say that primarily yeah. the reason you did that was because you want people to stop commenting on the clothing that you're wearing? Oh, not at all. <laughs> not Deep at all. insecurity. I, I, <laughs> yes, I, I was broken by the internet. <laughs> no, that style of documentary is, is well known, and Adam Curtis uses it, who's one of your known inspirations, right? It's the, it's the voiceover style using the archival footage, except in your case, you used like graphics and animation too, but archival footage with a voiceover is actually, it makes you appreciate, I, I mean, I guess it makes you I, you've made one before appreciate how difficult that kind of style of documentary is you think it would be easier because you're not on camera you have complete control you can use words and then cut in whatever images you want but then with that freedom maybe comes a little bit of difficulty of shaping a narrative in the first place when if you have stuff that's unfolding in front of the camera right all you have to do is describe it <laughs> yeah yeah i just think it makes for better content it's less uh less like a lecture and more like Something to experience, I'd say. Yeah, but I really enjoyed it. I mean, I feel like you're really coming into your own with with a certain kind of like stylistic bent. I mean, not not that I would like know how to define it, but I'm noticing like continuity for sure, like with with the archival footage. Um, and I also felt like maybe the the narrative style has like almost. I don't, you know, I, I kept thinking when I was watching it, though, about our video or sorry, our episodes, which we've done, I think, a couple about like critical theory being a conspiracy theory. Yeah. And like I kind of got that vibe a little bit from from it, like sort of there's like a suggestive nature to like, OK, here's this analysis that Virilio uses and Baudrillard. And it's and it's kind of like, you know, these controls. And now it's like, you know, it's not real because it's just a graphical screen. So when when it's not real, uh, you know, the deaths don't actually happen. And like the, and then like, you know, these military generals who are controlling this narrative. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's good. But I remember thinking to myself, like, it's it's also like but that's. I mean, that's Virilio and Baudrillard, maybe like this kind of the style of doing theory, which is which is like suggestive of like nefarious intent where there may or may not be it, I guess. Um, and I wonder what you thought about that. I prefer it as a style because like standing up there and teaching, why don't I just do a live stream if I'm just going to or just go back to go back to uh, university. So uh, really, the idea is actually using the medium for what I think the medium is best at. And in terms of conspiratorialness, I mean, there is, we, we've talked about this many times. Critical theory is conspiratorial. So it's not like directly conspiratorial. This was planned. But in this case, it was planned. Yeah, there was like, a conspiracy involved, a concrete and sort of provable one, I guess. Can you imagine like a Roman military general whose only job is to just go back and talk about what happened? No, they'd be using generals to do whatever fucking generals do. They yeah. wouldn't be just like PR voices. Actually, one one thought I had when I was watching it was sort of like, you know, the Desert Storm incident, a desert shield, I guess, at the time. Um, and then we got to, you know, where these images were being fed to us in, in kind of like a controlled way. But then I feel like one difference that's interesting uh, with like the Iraq war number two, um, which you cover a little bit in the video, is also that like with WikiLeaks and, and like new, like and like other and like the proliferation of the Internet and like more leaks and more information, like I guess the more that a medium is being used to control a message, I guess the more opportunity there is to like also use that same medium to like expose what's actually happening, right? And I think about those videos that WikiLeaks released of like the helicopter and you see the body parts flying, like actual people getting getting blown up. And then it made me think about Zizek because it made me think about how, like that idea of like ideology function where it's like, I, vote, I know very well, but still I don't care. Like I don't change. So it's like part of, it seemed like part of the premise of like the video was like, oh, they control the narrative. Um, they control what we see and what we don't see. So because we're not actually seeing people, it's like pacifies us. Um, which is premised on maybe this idea that if we did see it, then maybe like our behavior, we would not accept certain things. But then it seems like with the proliferation of the more more leaks in the inter and, and the Internet, we are seeing it like we're aware, like everybody's seen those videos with like body parts and like the guys on the on the on the radio commenting like got him sh like shit shot him. He's down like body parts exploding. It's like so we see it happening. But yet 
like nobody's really like nothing changes, I guess. Right. It's just the same. So like whether we see it or we don't, it doesn't seem to matter. And that was that was killing a reporter, the video that you're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, there's a few, but yeah, one of them. So and this is something you think about, like maybe like ideology is, yeah, the Zizekian ideology is maybe the other frame or sort of to think about it. Like ideology seems to boil down for Zizek to not to, you know, putting on the glasses and seeing things the way they really are, but but sort of the act of putting on and taking off the glasses shows you the difference between things being the way they are and things under, understanding that things are not the way they are. That's kind of the bottom line. So even when you add the sort of truth leak, wiki leaks, whatever to the debate, what it really just shows people is that things are not the way they seem, not that there's some deeper underlying truth to what's going on in front of us. And that's, a, I guess that's a sort of philosophical point that Zizek tries to make, especially in his like, um, especially in the perverts guides and the, uh, the, his video analysis too, his film analysis. It's funny you mentioned uh, wearing glasses because he actually directly references this metaphor um, by comparing it to uh, the John Carpenter movie, They Live. Yeah, uh, I, that's, where I, that's what yeah. I was thinking and, of. And the kind of thing that he points out is actually, you know, you don't take off the glasses of ideology. You have to put on glasses of critical theory precisely to be able to deconstruct the world that's presented to us and see what's really going on beneath it. Because our natural predisposition, if you want to call it that, is to live embedded in these kind of ideological frameworks. And it's I think the point that Victor is making, which is even more radical, is that even <laughs> if we put the glasses on, would we even give a fuck anyway? Yeah. Exactly. That was yeah, kind of the point. True. Because, because Zizek, that's the whole point of Zizek's thing when he says, I know very well that all these things are happening, but yet my behavior doesn't change. Or it's yeah, like I have yeah. conscious awareness and like I know, whereas like sort of the, 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 the way I, when I was watching Pills' video, I was thinking, okay, like the 1990s, like the early 90s, late 80s, when the first desert storm happened, it's like these technologies were newer and they were being controlled. And then like the analysis maybe at the time was like, oh, they're controlling it. They turn it into a video game, so we don't actually see it. But then the Gulf War number two, we do see it, but nothing changes because like there's WikiLeaks because it doesn't actually matter whether we see it or not. We yeah, want I mean, to it, believe that. It, it's an interesting kind of question, right? Because he talks a lot about that with reference to the ecological crisis, right? And the way that he sometimes seems to explain that away is by saying, when people say, you know, I know very well, but uh, it's because they secretly don't actually believe uh, in the kind of deconstruction of ideology that they've undertaken, right? They know rationally that the world is going to fall apart because of the ecological crisis, but secretly they don't believe it, right? Uh, in the same way, they know capitalism is driven by all these kind of contradictions, but their actions display that they don't really believe it. And I think that if we took your thesis seriously, Victor, um, that it would actually kind of damage this system because the predisposition is that if we really do push people far enough, uh, eventually they both will believe and act on something. Uh, whereas I'm not entirely convinced of that. I think that sometimes people might really believe that we're fucked to use the Zizekian term, right? Uh, and just decide to come completely apathetic and indifferent on that basis. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if that's still an ideological gesture or if it's just a retreat into a kind of cultural nihilism uh, that might also be like a psychologically appropriate yeah, I think it's just like a, I just think that there's not a, co like, like the correlation between like, like propositional belief in something and then how we behave is just like yeah. tenuous. And I'd wonder whether it is like, like a cultural nihilism or if, you know, a reporter getting blown up is just one more news cycle about terrible things that people do that have nothing to do with us and that we can't change. And that probably all along we knew was happening but I don't know that us knowing changes really all that much. And the function of the news, to me, is to make us need more news I mean, and it, to it, react passively, not to actually make us do anything or really to change something. It just I mean, seems. I would probably argue that WikiLeaks did have an impact on, like, and and like you know, um, what's his name, the the the, the whistleblower, um, Julian Assange, is, and no, he's the Assange, WikiLeaks the one, guy, the CIA, the NSA one. Oh, um, um, was it Snowden? Snowden yeah, Snowden. Yeah. Snowden. So like, so like he kind of showed, oh, this stuff is happening. Like, like a lot of stuff that we, you know, like theorize that they're using the, the sort of like intelligence technology for it actually is happening. And like, it had an impact. People were outraged. There's lots of pieces written about it, but then ultimately like did really much change. Like, uh, yeah, this never reflects on Obama. I think there's like, I don't want to talk out of my ass, but there's some, there's a stat that it's somewhere around 90% of drone strikes don't kill the intended target. 
Yeah. So either they miss or they kill like Sounds high, other but maybe, people. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's pretty well sure documented. It's there's there's loads of cross people caught in crossfire and misidentification too. And you could talk about the sort of you could talk about the sort of like ways they train AI is not is insufficient, for, right? It builds in racism. It builds in kinds of prejudices and things like that. Yeah, but yeah, even un, like learning that like okay from Snowden, learning that the government may be listening into your phone calls that our wires are tapped and th- those sorts of things. Like it doesn't change much because we seem to have already kind of suspected that that's happening and whether or not you get proof of that it it's me like i've you act in such a way as if it were true just to err on the side of caution and then when you learn it is true it's like oh well okay i guess i'm just justified to keep doing what i'm doing anyway maybe be a little more paranoid and a little more cautious and hopefully don't grow in up a kind of paranoid psycho psychopathology out of it but the, but yeah that's why you just carry on doing what you're already kind of assuming is going on in the first place like yeah atrocities and war are best friends we know that and whether or not they show us images that are sort of patriot washed and and sort of you know geared towards a public relations kind of point of view we understand what's going on behind that because that's what it is. Ideology, you understand that this is not the way it seems. And even that deeper truth that we know may be just another layer to the mystery rather than the point we stop at and say, that's the truth. I'm going to act based on that notion because, you know, it keeps evolving. It raises an, an interesting question that's kind of partially at the center of a lot of my research, which is like for radical politics, for egalitarian movements, like well, I think there's an interesting relation or there's there's kind of like interesting inconsistencies about like how the relationship between like knowledge or awareness of stuff or consciousness of things uh and action like how 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 because you know obviously going back to marx there's this idea that like class consciousness is like this crucial thing and and like you know even watching pills's video it's like it seemed like there's an implication that like oh they were using these technologies to to present a washed image because if we saw the real image of what was happening right like maybe we, we wouldn't we wouldn't, uh, you know, comply with the, with the way the situation is, but then, Uh, you know, but then there's also theory or there's also like lots of we, but now we know it's almost like a truism about like, you know, we're, we're we're almost like cynical about like the assumption that, that, that governments hide things that, that, and, and we've seen images, these leaks. And it's like, you know, seems like what, like what is the precipitator of change, I guess, in people's behaviors and the way and what they're willing to accept or not. I have a somewhat different take on that. I think that Pills is right that the medium accelerates these kinds of processes of desensitization and withdrawal uh, from the reality or the tangibility of violence. But I also think that if you take the philosophy of war seriously, the way that we conceptualize war has become a lot more total uh, over the course of probably the last hundred, couple hundred years. Uh, and consequently, we begin to be a lot more desensitized to individual acts of violence because we don't go to war with individual people uh, or even armies anymore, but with total societies uh, and the ideologies that we perceive them as representing. I mean, if you think of the medieval, like the, or if you think about like the Bible, right? Uh, Cormac McCarthy expresses this really nicely in Blood Meridian, right? There's this notion that war is natural. In fact, war might even be the natural state of humankind. Uh, and it's not to be blamed upon anyone. It's just the way things go. You go forward to like the chivalric age, there's this kind of one-on-one notion of war you see with the aristocracy, right? That I'm warring against you uh, or the knights are warring against other knights. Uh, Now we move on to the era where we're fighting against entire societies and what they represent. And the media plays a part in creating the sense of totalization. So in that respect, what does it really matter if somebody dies who might not have been a combatant, they were still a part of that society, ergo, they are still an enemy of some way, shape, or form, or at least they're embedded uh, in that guilt by association and can't really extricate themselves from that. Well, yeah, war war is a natural part of capitalism and the expansion yeah. of interests and imperialism and finding new markets, but it's the same. I think there's the same argument to be made that Zizek and Badiou say about like nature with a capital N, right? When you totalize it, generalize it, naturalize it in this way to have war with a capital W, what, well, from Zizek's perspective, what happens is it becomes an empty signifier. Or from from Badiou's perspective, it becomes depoliticized. It becomes something set out over and against politics, right? It becomes something like an empty signifier in which it has to remain empty of all content in order for it to perform a kind of organizing function on the 
chain of signifiers. So it itself cannot have any content. So these new efforts to sort of look at nature or look at war as things like socio-technical assemblages is supposed to offer a more politicizing point of view, one that isn't based on those sorts of universals. So we have the idea of nature and war as socio-technical assemblages specific to capitalism with a contingent history that could be otherwise. Yeah, Virilio talked about this. There's... No, he's saying it. It's, Matt's it's saying it. So this, you, you're really... talking about total war, but total war is this idea that's already existed since the 19th century, that the whole economy, the whole political apparatus is all going to mobilize itself together. But Virilio brings up this new idea that he thinks was born in the Gulf also, which is pure war. And I want to kick it to Matt. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that Virilia points out is there was this notion of total war that emerged in the 19th century that was really popularized during the First and the Second World War and involved this notion that we're waging war against an ideology. But the nice thing about it was you could still localize that ideology in a specific place. You know, Nazi Germany is Nazi Germany. We go invade Berlin. That's the end of it, right? Uh, whereas now with this notion of pure war, we've entered into a phase where there is no localization to these ideologies. They become global and they spread themselves out with such speed and rapidity that there's really no way of containing them. Think about this idea of war against Islamic fundamentalism or Islamic totalitarianism. Uh, and a network of terrorism that spreads across the globe and could be anywhere. You know, it could be localized at some points in Afghanistan, but it could also be some guy on your computer uh, in a suburban neighborhood in the United States. You have no way of knowing, right? Uh, so there's this complete liquidation of the very notion that we're waging war against something physical and specific and a movement towards war as a kind of pure activity waged for its own sake against an enemy that can never be pinned down. Uh, that we'll always have to confront, and it's a really frightening kind of prospect. Right, yeah, so and that, war, that's the... So, sorry, I just had to add this because it's the main definition of pure war, yeah. is that this is purified of humans. We don't have to go anywhere. We don't have to send the boys off anywhere. And for Virilio, this is purely technological violence, and it figures as, as technology with increasingly independence makes war on us as humanity. There is no peace anymore. There's just... Perpetual surveillance, perpetual drone striking, perpetual enemies. The war on terror is pure war. So pure war is the end point, and we don't know where like a final tipping point is going to happen. You know, the accident. But every human is a potential target. Yeah, and the uh, the the sort of technical term in semiotics for that would be the purification of war is war becoming a floating signifier that becomes radically decontextualized and sort of mobile and attachable to different situations, investable with different kinds of psychological and cultural values. So it loses its context and just kind of floats around over and above like this empty organizing function again. Yeah. I'd also I like to just point out here really quickly that this is very easy that, that, that like I was correct and, uh, and that we could do an episode about this, even though both, even though two of you haven't even watched the video, but, but easily I knew we could do a good episode of that. Yeah. Like the video. I want to talk about this book with Litvik, and I hope we do an episode on it at some point, but Cormac McCarthy has a great book called Blood Meridian that I referenced before, uh, where the character of the judge, who stands in for a lot of things, but one of them is the American modernist attitude, has this extraordinary monologue where he says, war is God, and before man was, war was there waiting for him, right? Uh, and the argument that he makes is that humankind wants war. We were lusting after it from the very beginning, precisely because it is a kind of pure engagement a contest in which uh, everything is put at stake, life and death. And so existence is kind of elevated to its highest pitch. And in an era like modernity uh, and now post-modernity, where precisely these kinds of affective drives for meaning become extremely powerful, uh, the notion of a kind of endless war would become extremely appealing because to go back to Benjamin, uh, and I'm sure Eric knows this, right? And is happy with this. Uh, nothing is much more entertaining than an endless war. Right. There's nothing that we can libidinally invest ourselves in more than something like that. Uh, and particularly when we can dissociate from it and assume that we can get all the kind of fun and excitement of war without ever actually putting ourselves personally at risk, uh, which isn't to say that real people aren't destroyed. They are. Uh, it just happens to be in countries so far away from us and in areas so distant from us 
uh, that we don't give a crap normally. Places like Afghanistan. Right? Yeah, and that's why I see it formally so similar to the ecological problem, right? Because yes, it's like right. war. Nature is always treated as that elsewhere, that place, that place you that things go when you flush the toilet, that place that the garbage <laughs> trucks pick up your shit and dump it. It's just other it's just elsewhere it's nowhere right it doesn't matter <laughs> i can di- i can disengage i can i can go about my day and not worry about it and in a way to worry about it too much is a sign of a kind of psychological disturbance that we want to sort of police each other out of that we want to cure each other of because just you know just enjoy your life man why worry about these things going on on the other side of the world right they're they're not affecting you so don't trouble yourself with them it's a it's a powerful sort of again ideology yeah i'll I'll convey an anecdote that kind of brought this home for me um when i was about 20 years old i went to go see romeo dallaire speak does everybody here know who romeo dallaire is shook hands with the devil so he was a commander of the un mission uh, in rwanda right and, and he tried to save as many people as he could during uh he's canadian by the way tried to save as many people as he could during the genocide but he was basically told primarily by the western states to not intervene because we didn't want to put to use pills term our boys in harm's way so we allowed the people to slaughter each other uh in the hundreds of thousands uh and to this day he wrote uh he feels extraordinarily bad about that uh, me being really young didn't appreciate that because I considered him kind of a hero for saving the few people he did. And I went up and I congratulated him, saying, "You know, you're a real inspiration to those of us who are involved in human rights, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And he looked me in the eyes, like, "Do you really think like I did something that was all that great? Like I saved a couple hundred people, whereas the story of what happened was hundreds of thousands of people being eradicated by their neighbors, their brothers, their friends, you name it." And it was a really shocking kind of moment for me because I had never really thought about it that before. But I think it was really symptomatic of the fact that I was embedded, as we all are, in exactly the kind of things you're talking about. Uh, I had only encountered the reality of war through this book, seeing this man. And the only thing I cared about was his experience. Uh, And I completely dissociated from the real consequences of what was going on there, which was the mass genocide of all these people. Right? Yeah. And you never get to the sense of actual consequences when war becomes a media event, which is the whole point of yeah. Baudrillard's uh, three three essays on it. Because, and this is this is a, exa- yeah. a perfect parallel to me in my mind, and I think this might be getting at what you were kind of calling the suggestion, Victor, is that CNN was like a, a, backwa- a backwater news station and became a national news station as a result of the Gulf War. Because it's 24 seven, you know whenever you turn on CNN, this is gonna be on there. We're, we're gonna do 24 seven news. And they, they've continued that model up to this day, but it starts with the seduction of war, which is you know fun, fun to follow along. Our reporters are embedded, our reporters are wearing bulletproof vests, so oh, they, they must be in danger. There you go for a little bit of a signifier there. And this becomes this, this I don't know what you call, I think Baudrillard calls it a uh, simulacral, he says we are simulacral protagonists. So we're involved in this war. Like this, this matters to us. While at the same time, it matters not at all to us. It barely even mattered to the soldiers that were there, most of whom never even saw con- or con- combat, if you've seen that movie, uh, Three Kings, I think. Oh, yeah, the George Clooney. Oh, Three Kings and Jarhead, too. The, they're, just, they're basically sitting around, and then the war was over, because they, they, they fought for 100 hours. That was it. It was like yeah. three days, and they just walked through the army. Basically about him, like the whole movie is like him waiting to shoot somebody and like not ever being able to because he's just sitting around the whole time. Does he not even fire a single shot in that movie? It's been no, a while. no. <laughs> so yeah. that's like, that is so perfect for this because we at home, I mean, none of us were watching this obviously, but we at home are invested. Where are our troops? You, you know, you get like the the armchair generals, just like the armchair quarterbacks planning. Oh, here's what I would do. And you get you get like just such a tiny sliver of information, but enough information that you think that you're involved and enough footage that you think you're involved. And then this just comes to dominate the entire event where you're like, ah, oh, good. We won. We watched this thing on, on TV for whatever it was, six weeks. And this became like the the origin of CNN, which is 24-7 news 
24 seven participation. And they still do exactly the same thing with politics today. Yeah, Rick Roderick had a joke about that in his lecture on Baudrillard that I really like. I'm not sure this is true, it's apocryphal, but apparently when he was asked uh, if he wanted to cover the Gulf War, Baudrillard said he would cover the Gulf War, but he wanted to watch it on CNN because that's where the war was really going to take place, right? Uh, I'm not sure if that's true, but it sounds like something Baudrillard would do, right? But, you know, just the, the striking opening of that essay where it says, you know, war is real if anything is really has this kind of Cormac McCarthy and almost biblical quality to it. You know, it is real, if anything is. Uh, and then the fact that they can now transform world into a spectacle just testifies to how liquid our concept of reality is right now, right? Which is why I think a lot of people kind of misunderstand that essay, because he's not trying to say that this was all unimportant or not, nothing of significant happened or that everything's been banalized, even though it is. Uh, he's describing a kind of epochal transition in human history where what was once the most primal thing that we engaged in uh, has been transformed into pastiche, right? And that's an and incredible. And if I can correct change. here, Rick Roderick wasn't wasn't his claim that the Iraq or the the American soldiers in Iraq were watching the war on CNN because they weren't even fighting? Oh, that, that's yeah. another joke in Nietzsche, yeah, where he says, you know, he talked to one of the janitors at Duke who was like there, and he was like, so what did you do there? He's like, well, I more or less did what I did here, you know, I was cleaning up and then they told me one day that it was over and I was done. <laughs> um, okay, so, so yeah. Baudrillard has a, I, I don't know why Rick Roderick didn't use this example, but this is great. Uh, Baudrillard says that when the, when the offensive actually started, like when the tanks started rolling, um, a huge portion of the Iraqi army was conscripts. They didn't even want to be there or know what they were doing there. Um, so they were just surrendering left and right. And Baudrillard says the, they were all, I don't know, I don't know what his source was, but he's like, all the soldiers were trying to surrender to the CNN cameras. They would run past the soldiers so that they could surrender to the camera. And he's saying this, of course, I mean, probably, it probably happened because they were worried about like getting shot in a trench, I mean, like yeah. <laughs> off camera. But if you surrender in front of the camera, then that you know you're safe. But this also shows for Baudrillard, the camera is the real power here. It's not the tanks. It's not the soldiers. You have to put your or show your surrender on TV for you to be safe. But that demonstrates who's in power here. Yeah, I yeah. mean that that reminds me of the way that when you're at like a protest and like it, you'll people will whip out their phones when when situations start to get hairy because the image has that that reality power. It has that reality value. I don't see how else you could explain something like that without this concept of hyper reality because then you have this sort of collapse of the sort of old distinction between the image and the reality, right? There's the appearance there on the screen and the reality is somewhere out there. If you're if you're bringing that kind of thinking to to your <laughs> thinking about war, right? You're going to have I, I guess you're, you're not going to be considering the hyper real quality of the war, which is the image is the reality. The image is more important and it has real power. It has real power to change things in the world, just like when at a protest or surrendering in front of a camera or getting more eyes on the situation has power in itself and it's hyper real. No, but I, I think the, what's really problematic is, sorry, go ahead, Victor. Well, like, I, well, I always wonder, you know, when we're thinking about like hyper reality and like the way the medium has changed um, our kind of like relationship to knowledge, to reality, to truth, you know, well, like before, you know, before CNN, before this, like, what was it like? Like, what was the kind of like, relationship that regular citizens would have had to reality? And I guess like, I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head. It's like, you know, I don't know, in Napoleon's time, like the French people would have like heard stories. It would have been what would it, did they have newspapers back then? Like, how was reality mm -hmm. constructed for for them and was it any more real uh was it any more constructed i mean maybe it was maybe it was like propagandistic in a kind of different way and like it would get framed because there was actually like less access to like immediate images it would just be like you know tales of, of, the, of the heroism that would go on and maybe you actually wouldn't get as much of like the banal truth that actually a lot of the time these soldiers were just like sitting around like not doing much or or certain atrocities were were being so i don't know like how like, I agree that there's something distinct <clears throat> about like the, this new medium that does create this kind of like hyper reality. And I think that's like an interesting and like kind of like convincing way of framing things. But but like was the was before hyper reality, was it any more real? I guess it's kind of like my question. Like, well, in what in what way? I think that's based on the slowness. There's two images 
basically that stopped the Vietnam War. Now, I'm not sure if this is true, but th this is kind of the story as we see it in hindsight. The one is that girl running away from her village yeah, from who's the, naked the Agent when she Orange got vision. Palmed. Yeah. And the other is uh, there's like a shot of a guy shooting a prisoner, like a guy who's like a handcuffed. Like a Viet Cong. Shooting him in POW. the head. POW. And this gave so much fuel to the anti-war movement and anti-war protests that basically, uh, and then uh, like all the conflicts that happened on, on campuses and in cities in the United States that made this war so unpopular that, you know, the next president is just going to be whoever says we're going to, we're going to stop being here. And I, yeah. this is the kind of a uh, narrative I tried to present in this video is that if, if they learned from that. They learned, oh, as long as we control the images, as long as we're the ones that are giving out the images, we don't have, they're not, because these are not real embedded reporters in the Gulf War. They're like with a press corps, so they're not getting actually shot at, they're not on the front lines, but they're like taken along for the ride. Whereas in Vietnam, there were a few reporters that were like, I'm just gonna go exactly where the action is, I'm gonna follow the soldiers, and I might die for it. So they have this, there's this now contrast where they're creating a hyper real complex of images that has nothing to do with what's actually happening. Yeah. So I'm that's the difference because what you were saying, what was it like before? If, if it's true, I'm not, again, I'm not sure if it's true. I wasn't alive, but if it's true that those two <laughs> images ended the Vietnam war, then they were not going to let any of those images get out a second time. I want to point out that you're absolutely correct in the assumption that this is done self-consciously. Um, one of the things that people criticized my postmodern conservatism book for was not talking enough about the Bush administration, uh, which my new book on cosmopolitanism actually does talk about. But in 2004, a New York Times reporter uh, interviewed Karl Rove. Uh, Karl Rove had this very infamous statement uh, where he said, you people in the reality-based community sit there and talk about facts and whether what we say is true or not. We're an empire now, and we create our own reality, and all of you are going to be doing nothing but sitting there and interpreting what we do centuries later, right? Uh, and he was very cognizant of the fact that you can exploit imperial power to direct the construction uh, of how people conceptualize what it is that you're doing in this very, very exacting way, which he thought he could achieve with the Iraq war, right? Uh, so I think it's really a mistake to assume that leftists are the... And, I know there's some leftists who think that we're the only ones who are cognizant of this. Many, many, many uh, conservatives are very sensitive to the way that you can manipulate people using these kind of hyper-real technologies. And in some ways, I would actually argue they're better at it because conservatives have always had a very instinctive understanding of the capacity of power and individuals who rebuild power to remake the world and in particular to manipulate the masses to achieve the ends that they want. Uh, and that's something I think on the left we're instinctively concerned to criticize. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, the priests and the... Pundits and politicians of capitalism probably know this better than the leftists do, oh, yeah. is that the image has that power, right? Because what was asked before is what would be the difference with the old sort of newspaper style of reality, and that's the gap between the event and the reporting, right? But today we have events occurring that are immediately disintegrated into a million images all over the world, right? So you get the the relationship flips around. No longer are we trying to write the article and fit the image to the happening, but the image itself is the happening. The gap is closed. I think Benjamin even makes this point in his work yeah. of art essay is that m more and more now reality is becoming produced. I mean, he would talk about like, like, like film and, and television is being produced to be reproduced, right? And what else is reproduced more than the image, right? Reality is being tailored specifically to the way it's consumed in, in modern sort of media, mass media society. And if we ever, you know, reach some kind of post media phase, then there'll be a new there'll be a new chapter in that theory. But for now, you know, we have an image administered reality rather than reality administering the images. And this is why I suspect, you know, Baudrillard would probably like uh, Inception better than better than the Matrix because the Matrix holds <laughs> on to that reality appearance distinction, whereas Inception doesn't, right? The top is still spinning at the end. So we never really know if we're all the way out or not. We just go in and out of the layers and there's no floor, there's no ceiling. <laughs> 
I did want to, I did want to like respond earlier to, to, to like, I guess the distinction between like the way that like the access that journalists had in Vietnam and the Vietnam war versus like, I mean, I think part of the, I mean, especially the second Iraq war, there's just like less happening too. Right. I mean, I mean like, so, because like the journalists, like they did get stuff out. I mean, at the very beginning, I brought up the fact like the WikiLeaks and like those videos of, 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 of like helicopters, like, you know, destroying people with these high caliber guns, like into, into body parts and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, that didn't change anything. It's like, you know, we saw that obviously if like we saw images of women and children, maybe being, being maimed on like that thing. And that, like, and it was clear that like children's body parts were getting torn apart. I'll bet that would have made a difference in people's psyches for sure. Um, it probably has to do with like the definition of the video too. It's too grainy. Part of it. That's too true. Small. That's true. That that's, that's, that certainly like makes, makes a difference. But I also think like, there's also just like less happening. So it's true that like the image was more catered, but it's also true that like, I mean, they weren't dropping napalm, right. They weren't like doing any of these things that were, I mean, they were doing these, pr- these drone strikes that don't like, I guess, lead drone strikes and like, like, you know, so-called precision missile attacks, which just don't, lend themselves i guess to the possibility for as many images of horror just because of the way that the the weapon functions right so like it's possible maybe like compared to at least napalm right where it's like you know this burning liquid that's being dropped on villages and shit it's just like it just it lends itself to the possibility of certain kinds of images uh being coming out well i, I want to say though i think this is a testament to the fact that we be didn't become desensitized in the ways that pill is t- pills is talking about uh, because something like that did happen, and I remember because I was involved in it very tentatively. So I was part of Amnesty International in high school, and in 2004, April-ish or something, uh, the Abu Ghraib torture videos came out. Uh, sorry, photos came out. Uh, and there was huge condemnation of these, right? Uh, and there was this claim that how can we claim to be any different when we went in there to blow Saddam up uh, and prevent him from torturing people, and now we're torturing them again in the same prison. We've just added Islamophobia into the mix, uh, you know, for good measure, Right. Uh, and far from having an impact on the American public, Bush was reelected by a bigger margin uh, than he had won in the first place, right? Uh, and I think you could chalk some of that up to fear and animosity in the war on terror and the fact that 9-11 wasn't that long ago. But if that photo had come out, um, say, two or decades earlier, earlier, I think it would have had a much, much bigger impact. Because I'll tell you, like, as much as I pushed that photograph into everyone's face, I could, being like, look at the horrible things he's done. You know, we need to do something about it. Most people's response was a big, like, Eh, what are you going to do? We all know that everyone's full of shit. The Bush administration full of shit. Who cares anymore, right? Uh, and it's really hard to fight against that kind and, of disposition. And Victor, I would like to say, in the Gulf War, you know that portion that was uh, the man crying in that video? That actually took place after the Amiria bombing, which was a shelter, and it was mostly women and children. And there are images of them cleaning up with mops. They're just pushing blood. And this is mostly women and children who are hiding in here and who got targeted by a quote unquote precision missile strike. And even and and that wasn't even I, like that wasn't secret. I'm sure CNN didn't report on it. I watched a lot of CNN footage. I didn't see any CNN reporting on it. But 400 people just get eviscerated. And I, I just think that we're too mediatized to even get feeling get emotion i i don't think that we can even think what people did in the 60s when it comes to images yeah i mean i, th- I think need it, to be it's more interesting like the <laughs> it's interesting that you that you because what i was about to say uh, was actually like i, I cut the one thought i had is like i i think that it's there's definitely something this idea that we've been like desensitized mediatized or whatever but but i also like i'm thinking about like the impact of that image right like the, the, the vietnam war image of that, uh, you know, of that woman, naked woman screaming, running from like the flaming village or whatever. If I'm even remembering, it's possible I'm misremembering the details. Of she, that was image, she was a girl. She was yeah, like, okay, a little, a little girl. Like, yeah, like and seven. and so, but 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 then I also think it's like, okay, well, have there been any images that created like a shitstorm in modern memory? And then I thought about the image of that little boy's body washing up to the yeah. shore, but, right? And it, and it's like, and I also wonder which like, one so is that? There is Sorry. Like, it was, it was during it was the Syrian the, civil war during the refugee crisis. The refugee crisis, and like they were trying to get to like maybe Italy. They were trying to like cross, mm, cross the, 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 Mediterranean. the Mediterranean Sea, and then like so. This I mean, that, boys, that was and really that, like, sad though. That was fucking. I look at that well, thing. But that's and my it, point. But that's my. But my point is like maybe there's actually something in our psyche. So like I do think we've been mediatized, but I think also like the type of image, like the specificity of it. It's like maybe seeing body parts of women and children isn't quite enough. Like it needs to be something 
that like is like a child and like it somehow evokes a kind of suffering for it to like have an effect on us and or like enough people because i think like maybe there's something i guess what i'm sort of like off the cuff hypothesizing here is maybe there's something that that image of the boy washing up on shore and the like girl running in vietnam have something in common that these other images that we've seen just don't and i don't know and like part of it might be about the mediatization of us but i mean part of it might just be that there's like there's just specific kinds of images that will hit hit the right kind of nerve that will actually get um which which speaks to like i guess our human kind of vulnerabilities and like our inability to make connections between or like turn images into or if images seem too abstract to us like empathize with it but could, you can could you, you can could you see the boy's face in that photograph yeah. that you're talking about i think but that's you can probably flip that. key you could flip that whole thing over or, and say like, okay, so how do we be proactive about these things though? Because if we, if images are what do this to us, then images keep us reactive. They keep us paralyzed. They keep us waiting for the next big thing to happen. And you can't be proactive because you need the image in order to do something about any situation. So it's, it's almost like a form of paralysis as well. Because you have these grotesque images emerging from war, and then you have this sort of reactive, cons like you're consuming the image, you react to the image, there's a short burst of outrage. And it's like very well, I guess it's very well documented and studied by now, is that the images themselves, but it does speak to the power of images still in this ridiculous ongoing persecution of Julian Assange that the Biden administration has just f chosen to completely continue on with, is that instead of attacking the content of the images, what's really going on? What did Chelsea Manning show us with this leak that Julian Assange helped get out? No, it's not addressing the issues. It's addressing the image, right? Stop the leak. It's couched in the terms of whatever national security. It's couched in terms of, of, of you know, journalism versus espionage and sensitive secrets, sensitive information and whatever, that's all an excuse to attack, not even like attack the messenger, basically, not even the messenger, the, the, the medium, attack the medium itself rather than the reality that is purported to be revealed to us through these images. And so, I mean, they know very well, these are incorporated into the political strategies that go on and Julian Assange's continued persecution is ridiculous but proof of that I think yeah I, I want to testify that I think that you're right uh, first off that these things can't be manipulated because if you look at the kind of visual reactions that have occurred as a result of these images most of them have been, been very transient uh, haven't affected broad change uh, and in fact it's been the political right that's been better able to harness the power of imagery in order to create permanent and enduring political movements committed to the advancement of their causes. Take the example uh, of the kid uh, who was drowned uh, as part of the refugee crisis, right? Uh, there is a momentary mo uh, moment period By the way, if anybody where... wants to look that up, you can just uh, Google the death of Alan Kurdi, K-U-R-D-I. Yeah, it's haunting stuff, especially when you consider that Syria was a fractured nation uh, left alone because of European colonialism, and we bear a lot of the blame for what happened there so decades later, right? Uh, but the primary movement that was mobilized as a result of the European uh, refugee crisis wasn't the political left uh, and humanitarian causes. It was the political right, which surged to power in many countries uh, because they were able to better mobilize images of so-called hordes of refugees entering into your country, looking dangerous, uh, and we need to do something about that. Uh, and that's true in Hungary. It's true in Poland. It's true in Germany. Uh, it was true in the UK and was a big factor uh, with the Brexit vote, if you think back to Nigel Farage, right? Uh, or you can flash forward to, I think it was 2018, uh, when there was the crisis going on in the US border, uh, where I remember Times tried to make exactly that parallel when they pointed to some of the children who were in cages, being in cage by um, the Trump administration. And they said directly, this is our Vietnam image, right? This is going to finally be the point where people break away from Trump because this is just beyond the pale. A week later, no one gave a shit. No one cared at all. Yeah, right? it's too short lived. And now, even under Biden, right? They're they're he just approved the building of like a private prison for 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 ICE prisoners specifically, or something like that. Like, yeah, it just no, I, keeps I it going. Joe. Yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah, and the only people who benefited from that were Trump. Trump gained de weeks and weeks of traction from his supporters. All of them said, "Invading caravan, invading caravan, must do what we want." 
I saw somebody who went on, I think it was Fox News, and when he was get, showing a picture of the children in cages, his response was, wah, wah, and did not care. Uh, and he was cheered on by various right-wing media, right? Uh, so we're really very bad, I think, at finding ways to take the initial spur of humanitarianism that's generated from these extraordinarily haunting images and transforming them into the kind of lasting political movements, as Eric would put it, that will really affect change. Uh, the ones who are good at doing that are the political right. Call them postmodern conservatisms or fascist or whatever you want, right? Uh, so I think we need to be a lot better at it. I'm not sure what the solution is. I think we'd be... Re- I think we'd be remiss if we didn't bring up at this point, because the reason I asked, were they body parts or how do they have faces, which sounds extremely callous, but uh, Emmanuel Levinas, the face of the other, and he's not talking about necessarily physical faces, but the sort of metaphysical experience of a face, not really a physical face. Maybe we have to do a whole episode on this. But the experience of seeing someone else there is part of that, um, I don't know, that call to a deep humanity might be a good way to say it, that you realize that this is another person. And for whatever reason, this kid on the beach picture did that. And this uh, kid in the cage didn't do that. Yeah, for a brief period of time, I should say, very brief. Yeah, I mean, you get the same thing with the with uh, Stanley Cavell too, and the importance of the face, right? You get like that shot of that old school movie with Joan of Arc and on the on the Deleuze cross. You have faciality. her face, and then you have the sort of opposite conversation about pornography, which which completely sort of dis- disintegrates the body into parts and erogenous zones, and there's no unity to it. The only unity you get in pornography is when someone gets out and makes a makes a expose or a documentary. But that's not you know that's not how it works. That's not what's what's libidinally exciting about pornography. Even though it's a terrible industry, we know that it's got so much horrible shit going on. It's that those body parts and those signifiers and those that sort of disunity that gets you. So. I don't know if that that idea that can then be flipped into uh, you know if you see body parts from a war it's it's it doesn't have enough unity for us to want to do something that's just that's just a hand that's just a purloined fist or something like that who knows well, I just want to end with this uh, then I have to go because I got to make dinner for the next three days uh, but I think one of the interesting things about what we've been talking about is three how- days what are you talking about <laughs> what are you making. <laughs> Don't you want to know? Because uh, <laughs> the kind of hypersaturation of images and how counterintuitive this development might seem uh, looking backwards. Because think about Foucault's Discipline and Punish, right? He says that the transition from societies of sovereignty where violence was employed as a spectacular means of control uh, to disciplinary societies in one sense uh, was the attempt to hide violence, hide the reality of state coercion, Right. Uh, So rather than executing someone in public, we did it behind closed doors because we felt a certain sense of guilt and humanitarianism about it. Uh, And I think what we see now kind of confirming to lose a society of control thesis, uh, along with a bunch of others, is how people have recognized that trying to hide the reality of violence doesn't necessarily work because it can come out in precisely the kind of Vietnam way that Pills was talking about. So the other solution is to just super saturate everyone uh, with these kinds of images so they become completely yeah. desensitized uh, to the reality of what's going on. And they can never have enough time to actually assemble the kind of critical energies that would be necessary to mobilize against any of the developments that they're witnessing. Right. That's, that's can I, can I give an example of that? I mean, it's in my, sure. it's in my video if you want to watch it, but I, like, I am going to watch it tomorrow, <laughs> but the guy the he's a colonel in the air force or something and he's like showing the reporters what's happening and it's a an f-115 dropping a bomb on a building and he's like this is my he makes a joke about it he's like this is my uh my basically my equivalent in the air force here this is like the air force building in iraq and we're dropping a bomb on it and they all laugh and they're all just sitting there watching a bomb drop on this building like do you think that building's empty yeah it's just gro- this, he it's says, this is the, this is the headquarters of my iraqi counterpart oh yeah my counterpart and they and they're all laughing and i'm like is this not insane that we're just like watching people die 
and laughing about it like this is like an entertain this is just entertainment they might as well be sitting in a fucking movie theater watching avengers 11 yeah and as a testament to the kind of phenomenological point about the face that you're mentioning one of the things that Foucault points out in that book that i think is really brilliant is that the problem with these kind of sovereign displays of violence is that when people go and watch someone get executed they start to empathize with the person being who's suffering right uh, rather than seeing him as a traitor to the crown, they say, why is the crown doing all this kind of horrible stuff to him? Look at his face. Look at how much pain he's in. We should do something about it, which is one of the motivations to move towards disciplinary powers and hide it away. Uh, whereas now you could see a lot of people who are involved in exactly the same kind of suffering uh, being inflicted upon them as what happened in uh, earlier forms of sovereign power. But because there's so many of them and because we see them on screens, we become desensitized to it. Uh, and we look at a building blowing up, like Phil said, and we say, look at that. You know, it's kind of like what I did in Call of Duty. I remember I blew up a building in some weird Middle Eastern country. That was awesome. You know, uh, it's really just a shocking kind of development. And it makes me very worried for the future. But this is before Call of Duty, even. This is like the <laughs> old, the or, the origin of Call of Duty is CNN. The purpose of Call of Duty is that you get to do that cool shit that you saw on TV. Yeah. I mean, I get that sense what you were saying just when you started, Matt, gave me made me think of of the ways that, you know, the right wing media machine is kind of caught up with the left wing kind of image administered reality point of view, because they know that for every narrative, you can just put out a counter narrative immediately. For every image, there's a counter image. For every way of understanding some event, there's some alternative way of understanding it. And it creates a kind of radical uncertainty in people and i think i mean not to transition to anything else but i think that's where cancel culture tends to get its strength from is that we yeah. no longer trust the image we have to go with our gut we have to stick to our principles we need things we need some kind of guide to sussing out the meaning among all of this mess of images and counterpoints and points and it, it energizes it in a certain way because all we have left to cling to are our morals. And if we slide into nihilism, then there's no meaning and it is just nothing. But it becomes a political strategy on the right to do that. Every time we put out something about how war is bad, they'll put out something about how war is good. I read this image this way. Oh my God, there's right on the right on 4chan or some fucking place like that. There's another <laughs> way of reading uh, the image that also gets defenders, right? So how do you ever like consensus in our culture is probably the furthest thing away from reality at all because we can't agree about anything. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but I I will say I got to go, but I think this is really a neat conversation and I'll see you all when we I get back, okay? Take care. See ya. Bye. All right. Well, yeah, that was off the cuff. All right. So Matt had to leave. Um, just so you, you patrons know, we had a completely different topic planned and then it turned into hyper reality and war yeah which is a, a good topic it felt organic and we got to cling to that when we can <laughs> but i i did i am a little disappointed i did spend a good amount of time prepping and making a little crib sheet today <laughs> no, we'll still do that one we'll still do that one next time okay cool yeah we were well just just as a preview i guess then we're, we're going to talk about the chair which is a show on netflix so i guess if you hear this then and you haven't seen that yet then check it out you might not enjoy it you might you might watch some of it to get an idea of how it is it, it's only three hours but yeah. before the next two weeks we we're going to talk about the chair because it's a show about academia yeah cancel culture tenureship campus protesting hysterical hysterical students right so we're gonna and, and it actually does quite a good even-handed job of dealing with some of these issues but we we we've all been to university and we, and as, some of yeah, us still are as narcissists <laughs> we love when people talk about us in on netflix yeah anything i feel like i have uh, anything i feel like i have firsthand experience that i gotta jump on the opportunity to talk about it because everything else is uh, everything else i've seen in images only and I don't know if it's real. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, did you have any follow-ups on this uh, image versus reality notion? Because this is like, I mean, it's Baudrillard's entire thesis. But I, I think this word desensitization, it's a little bit off in some way. Because, and I and I don't know what it yeah. means, but like we, we hear 
people that have always talked about are you're gonna get desensitized if you play like too much counter strike then you're not gonna grand theft auto was the big one right it's gonna desensitize you to violence to thievery and there's something off about that word but there's also something about like if you see one other image in a day even if it's a terrible image it's it doesn't have the same gravity so i see what that word is saying but I also don't see the connection between playing too much GTA and then you're actually going to like well, just beat somebody up well, and not I, care. Well, I think the studies have shown that there is no connection there. And I think it's we are right to distrust that word because the context it always comes up in is finding something to blame for moral failures or criminality or something. What, what are we going to blame in this decade? It's going to last decade was Grand Theft Auto. What do we blame now? Social media, right? Or some or, or universities. <laughs> Before that, it was satanism and heavy metal yeah every every fucking generation has its big scapegoats for its problems and they tried to shoehorn video games into that but now we know things like video games actually have great benefits if you play a lot play a lot of video games and you you're you're a better pilot you're a better driver they want people who play video games in the army in certain capacities yeah yeah and also i I was gonna say like isn't it in a way more accurate like especially if we think about it from a sort of phenomenological lens to say that like images or like kind of the uh, being saturated in certain kinds of images or I mean in the case of video games I guess that's more than images too that's like activity that you're doing with your body it's actually like not desensitizing but it's actually just creating a different kind of sensitivity matrix or something like that it's it's like your you know your 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 presuppositions your the way like your pre-reflective engagement with the world is altered by it so you actually like your body becomes sensitive just in a different way so like it just yeah. takes up maybe part of that is is that is like the, this effect where it becomes hyper real in the sense that like it, it 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 doesn't have the impact that it maybe would have had but that's not because you're less sensitive but just because it, it's like becomes part of like the background uh and, it, and it's taken up and it's mediated through a screen too which already uh, doesn't doesn't feel uh, like real in the same sense. Yeah, that, I like, like that. Uh, seeing something. I like that. I like William and I like Raymond Williams term. Um, every every sort of era has its own unique structure of feeling, and and it, and video games contribute big to altering our our structure of feeling. Right? I can my my reality is permeated with video games i've played them since i was a kid and and i don't know sometimes i walk down the street and go do 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 or like hum some super mario or something like that i don't know it's just and and yeah you do get different sensitivities right even like you know the the click of the clicking of a shotgun may make you think of the game doom or something like that rather than uh something people might someone else might think of i don't know a, a lynch mob or something like that who knows someone might put think bird shot buck shot bird shot buck shot when you hear that i don't know it creates a different sensitivity exactly exactly and actually just like a super like you know kind of benign example this morning i watched this video it's like a new vox video and it was about how like the, the sound of a loon a loon call how it's like used ubiquitously in movies whenever there's like a nature scene and how it drives like bird watchers crazy because it's just like it's just used because and i realized that like they showed a bunch of scenes and for some reason, the loon call just like has become associated with like the wilds, Ooh. nature. So it doesn't matter like where it is. Loons only exist in Canada and like the northern United States. But for some reason, you'll see like movies, sometimes even on different planets. <laughs> and it'll be like a loon noise in yes. the background. Yeah. Talk about a floating signifier, eh? Yeah. And then when I hear it, all I think of those shitty national heritage commercials we used to be exposed to all the time. Or 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 the commercials. Is it just a? And I'm asking also the the patrons because you have the ability to comment here. Um, but if that's not the word, I I think we're all agreeing that there's something to that. Like if you if you see w- one other image after you've seen ten thousand images that day, which we typically do, then what is it about desensitization? And then why is it that every once in a while one of these images actually breaks through? And maybe one possible response to this could be, you know, McLuhan's dictum, uh, the medium is the message. So if you get your image through news, the message of news is that there's always more news. That's what news is. It's like, you know, do your reaction and then move on because there's something else coming right down the pike. So get ready. 
So it, that would that would be a contrary thesis to desensitization. It would be like, okay, I'm done with that information. I have to get ready for whatever's coming next. So I can't really spend too much time getting outraged and becoming an activist over this one issue because there's more news coming. Yeah, I think we were on something when, when we were talking about the face. I think the face, I mean, Levinas, you know, bringing in Levinas, like, I think that makes sense. I think the face does have an impact. I mean, that picture of the boy on the beach, you can't actually see his full face, but you can see most of it. You see enough of it that you're like, oh, wow, that's a little boy. Jesus Christ. Like, Does anyone want to give the brief summary of the faciality? I, I, don't, I, don't know. I don't know it well enough to just summarize yeah, it. I. Damn, I, haven't, I haven't read it in years, but if I can, if I can try... You see the face as like the forward face of the other. And the other is something that you know is like real and deep that the face is only in front of. So you know that there's more reality there. You know that there's like a, we would just say in normal language, we'd say there's a person there. I'm empathetic towards them. I, I feel like they feel the same way that I feel about things. And the face yeah. is like just the surface of that. So it's uh, this like radical empathy that you can get. And we're talking about it in terms of the image here, which I think is not, it's not misplaced. But there's yeah. something about seeing, and maybe that's the difference between that, 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 that Apache helicopter gunning down a reporter, why that wouldn't have the same effect as maybe the, uh, the, those prison photos, the Abu Ghraib yeah. photos, or the or the Vietnam ones. Yeah, I mean, just to even just to add to that, because I can't summarize it better than that. But you know, Levinas is, believes that ethics was the fundamental philosophy rather than ontology. So this is a kind of story of the origin of our like ethical selves and our ethical being. So you have you know you're supposed to take this figuratively and not historically but back in like when you say like a tribe right they never seen outsiders everybody's face they they kind of directly identify with their own face but then you see the face of the other you know the come the face suddenly pops through the bushes and then you you pause right you're going to stab that thing and then you pause and see that it has a face and that's supposed to be a kind of story of like the metaphysical origins of ethics and why it's the first philosophy and I don't really know how to shoehorn God into that because he has the, the the self, the other, and the third, which is like kind of like a God, the infinite perspective kind of thing. And and that that beginning leads you towards the say, sort of infinity and God and all those other sorts of big ethical categories he he he, he writes about in his books, like what totality and infinity. The basis of it is I see you, I don't know you but I'd still don't want to kill you. That's like the first experience. Cause otherwise is this, if you have to pause and think, is this an enemy? Is it a friend? Is it, Oh no, it's something like me. And that's the beginning of philosophy. And patrons, I do want you to take that with a grain of salt because like I said, it's been years since I read it, but we're, we're not wrong. We're in the right ballpark. The face is the face yeah. of the other. Yeah, that's pretty good. And then this this question of desensitization, yeah, I think just my my last cent on that is just it's it's a misnomer, right? Because it's supposed to be our, our moral sensitivity and not our like actual sensitivity. Although it does have those you know those connotations of of skin and feel raw skin, right? And then scabbing over and it becomes desensitized, but uh, like it'll very literally. Whereas I think anesthetized is probably better. I like drawing that from Benjamin as well. When you're anesthetized, you're made passive, you're made into an object of politics rather than an active participant in it. And so anesthetics is the sort of aesthetic of fascism, whereas aesthetics becoming awakened is, is kind of the aesthetics of communism. And that's the one we want to go for. We want to go for the the aesthetics which is again is the greek word for your senses right if you take it back to its origins it actually just refers to kind of your your perceptual apparatus and the sort of what we were talking about earlier the structure of our perceptual apparatus our structure of feeling or our 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 sense of different sensitivities so we want to cultivate that in our sort of image-based worlds. And so desensitization seems to have these weird moralistic overtones that I don't like. And I think it's a misnomer as a result of that too. Yeah, I agree with that.
So that was good. That was a pretty nice little, uh, yeah. Off the cuff well, there. <laughs> um, just so the patrons know before we started talking, Victor was like, Oh, we should do a, an episode on that video. I'm like, nah, no one's going to have, no one's going to have anything to say about that. So, Victor, I have to publicly apologize to you for <laughs> second guessing. Yeah, you were sure wrong. And just to be clear, too, it also started with with you being like, okay, well, why don't you just like talk for five minutes about like what you thought about the video, and then we'll transition. And then we're like, we start talking like fifteen minutes in. Pills is just like in the chat. So <laughs> maybe we should just keep talking. Just about keep this. going. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, let, let's look for a transition. I don't know how we're going to pull council culture out of war and hyper reality, but we we could probably do it. But it was, I think, it was probably better this way. You know, an episode's an episode. My prep work can still be preserved. For I also, day. and uh, it's always good to also just do the cl- cross platform because, like, even though we don't have anything to do with the videos, I still think it's nice to have the like uh, to like have some cross pollination. Of talking yeah. about videos and on the podcast, yeah, that's good stuff. We we sh- we should do this from time to time. So if you're if you're listening to this, uh, we do have a lot of stuff prepared for the chair, which is not like it's definitely not the best show ever made or anything like that. It's just uh, it connects to our experience and it's really incisive on on many points on what on what it does and it's only it's only like what three hours total yeah yeah they're short little episodes like they're i think they're like under half an hour most of the episodes so like there's something that you can just like take little bite-sized pieces of as you go watch an episode here and there yeah they're funny and i i do think it is it is a very sophisticated kind of treatment of cancel culture and tenureship and intergenerational struggles so that'll be and some the acting fun was really good yeah, they cast it pretty well. I think they cast it very well. And, and, and Sandra O, oh, she's a Ottawa native from my hometown. Yeah, of Grey's Anatomy and um, what's that other show she was in, Killing Eve, the, of that fame. I really like other that big old, names. the old bitch lady. Oh, yeah, she's the, awesome. She, she was I know, awesome. I know a professor exactly like her. Went to oh, her yeah, so do now. I. That's, like, exactly um, the I wonder if it's the okay. same one. That's uh, Sarah, Sarah Paulson's wife, I believe. Uh, Sarah Paulson's uh, big character in uh, American Horror Story. That's her wife. Yeah, she's very funny and a good actor. (laughs) Anyways, patrons, um, we're going to give you uh, the choice of an episode coming up. We're also working on a big series, which we're excited about. Don't want to don't want to jump the gun here. But uh, thank you always for your support. What'd you say? I just said don't anticipate too many things. Because oh. they get to choose an episode, they got the chair thing coming up. That's enough. Yeah, but they want to. Yeah, they got to pick one for us. We haven't done that since like May. So, got some do. stuff in the pipelines. Just don't pick. Just don't pick Deleuze. Okay, thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna do it now. You just sealed the deal. I know. Man. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. All right, reading everybody. about their take on faciality now. That's all they're going to want to hear. What is that? What do they say about it? You're, you're going to have to open up a big copy of ATP and start fuss, fussing with what's, what's going, going on, on in that. <laughs> well, the problem is like that. There's almost probably more written on that plateau than any of the other plateaus. So it would it would be a bit of unpacking. We'd be beating a dead horse mostly. It's a good concept. It's been done. Anyway, thank you all very much. And uh, we'll see you next week. Adieu. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Talk to you next week. I shouldn't say that. Yeah. (laughs) Adieu. Adieu.